Hello, it is 4 p.m. Eastern time, and it is time for the evening broadcast to begin, at least on the East Coast. Hello, Pete. I feel like I haven't seen you in an hour. Uh, one whole hour. It's hard to believe. You know, hour. this isolation stuff, I've never been with you so much since ever. we started COVID. Ever, ever. Ever. I, I mean, mean, even on real shows, one... I'm not with you this much. I mean, the debates are the only time where 30 days straight we're together. Aside from that, um, yeah. we're maybe maybe we get six days at a time together. So hey, um, Kelly, <laughs> this is awesome, right? I, I yeah, hear you. Yeah, go ahead, go for Kelly. Um, <laughs> we're we're starting to have a little good time here, uh, maybe more than we should, but that's all right. Um, today's topic, IAS, but we've already talked about IAS. You say. Yes, we, we have can never about talk IAS. enough about IAS. We can never talk enough about IAS. Today, though, we're talking about IAS and the software creator of IAS, right? We heard uh, mention of Jason's name uh, uh, when James was on talking about, you know, when when they were developing this whole thing, right? Where were the features and things like that? And, and the software guy? Well, this is him, Jason Eskew. And, you know, many times, Jason, um, I would call you up and go, I need to get my copy reauthorized on my computer. I I just replaced it or or my favorite C colon, you know, format C colon, right? Command, um, forgetting all my DOS commands, but you know, the ones that your wife I had to do. Um, how better things are now with the ability to uh, to have people just take care of their own. Um, but the, the idea of this, this is probably the single most transformational software in the the pro audio industry. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we talked about AZ Edit yesterday. From a control standpoint, is um, uh, very much the word, the Microsoft Word of mm -hmm. broadcast, right? Um, and comms. Uh, it's parallel. The closest that I would say is IAS. It is, um, it's in everyone's workflow. Um, it's, it's interesting because not only is it in everyone's workflow, it's not exclusive to, um, to everyone's workflow, meaning I'm still running my managers. You know, we heard from Carl uh, earlier today on Electrosonics, right? And the control software. Um, IES doesn't replace control. IES, um, augments all these manufacturers' systems, right? Um, IS isn't meant to give you a look inside of that receiver. You know, you'll hear a lot of arguments about, you know, wow, man, if I could just have one program that did everything. Well, if you want one program that does everything, most likely you'll find one program that does nothing well um, in terms of uh, the intricacies of every nuance of control. Um, there are some some things out there, but um, it's very it's very difficult to to do that. And IAS said, "Hey, you know what? We're here to plot a solution for you. Give us this information. We'll take this other information. We're going to pull it together, and now we plot a solution that works well." Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, today isn't about necessarily. I know Pete and Jason will step through a coordination. Uh, we've done that several times now, but this session isn't about how to use IAS, but rather how we use IAS. How did we get here? How do we get to use IAS the way we're using it today? Um, what's its role? How how should um, how should we interpret what that button really did? So I'm pretty excited about it. I see our attendees are are uh, you know continuing to pile in. Um, I expect a lot of questions today. Um, I expect that this one probably won't end on time, but you know what? None of ours do, and we're proud of that fact. Um, thank God we don't pay for satellite time on this show because we would be broke. Um, anyhow, Pete, why don't you walk through the Q&A? I will be playing Q&A person today uh, since Pete and Jason will be actively involved. So get your questions in. Keep them coming, and um, what we will um, we'll look to do, Jason, Pete, when we're ready to to take a pause, give me a heads up, 
we'll dive into some questions because we got videos. We got videos yep. to show today. This is yep. brand new to our platform. Thank you, Jason. Bringing who who would have ever thought to use video in today's age? You know, amazing. There you go. There amazing. you go. Um, you know, Ed. you know, IAS is to me the Kleenex of coordination programs. When people come to me, they said, "Are you going to IAS us?" You know, it's like. It's, but I may be using, using some other software. They don't know. They just call it IAS. So it really yeah. is it is the 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 simplest, most straightforward, most powerful program out there, and uh, that's why I particularly like it. Um, uh, Jason is in the middle of writing a, a brand new version someday down the line when he has enough weekends where his kids don't drag him out to the playground. Uh, and then we'll have other features, maybe even things like I've been asking for, for remote control of my spectrum analyzer. So you click on a frequency and it pops up on my analyzer. That's what shameless, I want. Shameless plugs by Pete. Um, uh, why, hey, why not? Why not? I, and you should. It's our platform. If Jason doesn't like it, we already have his videos and his narration. So worst case. Exactly. Worst case. Exactly. We up on exactly. We're okay. Uh, but so I, I think, we're, you know, we've topped off. So I'm going to click off now, Pete. Um, everybody. Put your questions you got into it. the Q&A panel. I'm going to be watching. I see them starting to come in. Take it away, boys. Okie doke. Go, go ahead, Jason. Or, okay. So just to cover some background about why we do some of the things in IAS uh, and how the equipment actually drives what's going on. Uh, I'm going to do a, a short demo to kind of pull together some information. And then Pete's going to do a, a short demo as well. And in between, we've got some uh, some videos to, to show some of the hardware interaction. Um, it, one of the key concepts for IAS is it's not just about crunching the numbers. That's what it does, but it's much more a tool for managing the information. What frequencies uh, do you need? Uh, who's involved? Picking clean freaks uh, quickly. Um, it all harkens back to a couple of programs from Vega and from Sennheiser in the DOS world in the mid 90s. IMDPC, which was only good for VHF, and UHF IMD, uh, which I think Gary Stanfield probably wrote these. And then Turbo RF from Sennheiser had some features that I kind of cherry picked out. But most, okay, so backing up, I started working for James Stoffo out of his house in 1996. Uh, we moved to our first commercial location uh, probably the, the following year. Uh, James, with his history at Vega Wireless, uh, we had a real good relationship with Vega. And also, those are the tools that he had used for years and he taught me to use. Um, but as a developer myself and a bench tech, uh, I knew that there were better tools and, and better ways to do some of the stuff that we were doing. And I also knew this is, you know, Windows 95 had just come out and DOS was going out, it was on its last leg there were way easier ways to, to interact with PCs. When we were still working out of this house, I started playing around with rewriting um, IMD PC to something that would be easier to use. Version one of IAS. That version one never got off the ground. Um, I flipped around and started writing it uh, the, uh, version two in VB6 which was a language that I had already been using for many years. And I used that for probably five or six years by myself. Uh, I, I got around to rewriting a version three in VB.net. That would have been probably around 2004. Um, and there were a lot of improvements. And I started letting other people within the company use it at that point. And they were raving. It, it was uh, it was making their job much easier and faster. Um, version four, I cleaned a bunch of stuff up, 
and we fixed it. And we released that around Infocom 2006, and that's when we started selling IAS. Uh, 2013, 2014, I converted from VD to C Sharp, uh, and I changed a bunch of internal structure. Right now, I'm currently working on version six, and can't tell you when it's going to be released because it isn't ready yet. But there's a bunch of features I want to roll in, as well as fixing some stuff underneath the hood that nobody actually sees, but it's holding features back. I can't do the, uh, the locking feature correctly without a whole lot of extra work until I get these features fixed. Uh, common question, when's the Mac version coming out? In 2013, I actually bought a Mac to do development work with. I uh, still haven't finished a Mac version yet. And honestly, it'll probably only be an iOS version because the technology is changing and the tooling uh, for writing the code is, works better against iOS than the Mac, surprisingly. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide there. It's the FM video. Oh, go ahead. So let's take a look at an FM transmitter. Yeah, it's out of focus. Sure UHFR FM transmitter. 480 megahertz. We'll turn it on. We've got a carrier, and we've got these pilot tone carriers uh, that are you can see in the modulation. As we talk into it, the modulation increases. No audio to maximum audio changes the amount of deviation. Demo. That demo demonstrates the how much energy and how wide the spectrum is. Um, most uh, of, of what we've presented so far in the previous show and, uh, and in other places is a static image. And what you see in the graph of IAS is just a line. That line represents uh, this fat kind of carrier that changes based on the amount of modulation. Okay. Let me preface this with the previous show on IAS showed all the basic features and answered all the questions at the time that were asked. Uh, so I, I'm not going to rehash uh, and show all those basics. Uh, Jason, uh, we've got disconnected, I think. Jason, I'm going to go ahead and play the next video while you get reconnected. This video is called Carson's Rule. We turn the internal speaker up and we can hear that 1K tone that we're modulating at 25 kilohertz of deviation. We're going to turn that off for a moment. Zoom in on the receiver and the spectrum analyzer. And we've got the carrier frequency of 500 megahertz, maybe a little bit of noise modulating it. 10 kilohertz per deviation, so a pretty narrow view. Let's go back and turn on that generator again. 25 kilohertz of deviation. We're receiving it, 0.6% distortion. Zoom back in. Now Carson's rule says that 98% of our energy, our RF energy, should be contained in the bandwidth defined as the 1 kilohertz tone plus the 25 kilohertz of deviation times 2. 
and that gives us 52 kilohertz of deviation. 10k per span, one, two, and a half, a little over from there to there, should contain 98% of our energy. And yeah, we'll call that good. But that works for transmitters. For receivers, we need much more bandwidth in order to recover that signal with no distortion. All right, so Pete. Okay, Jason is not back yet. He's still trying to log on. The wonders of the webinar. Yeah, I want a spare machine. There we, we go. go. So we, we got, got your you. audio. Yeah. Okay. We're no move audio on. from the video, so hang on one, one second. Um, uh, no, I, I see him. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of people saying that they're not hearing the audio from the videos, which is well, well, interesting. Um, talk over it. Yeah. Um, you want to play that last one again? Should I play Carson's uh, rule again? Yes, we should. We should play yes, Carson's please. rule again. And and while we're here, just for a second, um, the um, some are hearing both had heard both videos. Okay. So it's just a few folks that uh, working in the video. Okay, good. Uh, hearing the audio from video. Okay, so it just seemed to be a couple folks that were having issues. Um, so we'll um, we'll bundle these videos with the archive. So that question, but I think we're generally okay. It was just a handful of people, and unfortunately, um, maybe an issue there. It's, uh, so, all right. Thank you, folks. Sorry about that. I will let you guys keep going. So, Jason, we played Carson's rule. If you want to explain any of that, go on to the receiver block diagram. Okay. okay. So, the purpose of showing that video was to show that the, the energy that we show on a graph, um, or that has been shown in the previous videos, and we get the volume. Uh, uh, Jason, Jason, we've got to turn off your mic on the first laptop. It already is. No, they're both on. All right. We're getting both of them. You sound great in stereo, but not for this show. Uh, no, too ahead. much echo. How's that? Any better? Much better. Yeah, I got the other machine off now. Um, okay, so in the previous uh, show on IAS, everything was, was shown how to use uh, the application how to do a coordination, a lot of questions were answered. There's no need to, to redo any of that because it was all correct. The purpose of these demos is I wanted to show how actual hardware drives some of the decisions that we do in IAS. Um, Pete, can you roll back a slide? I wanna go back to the, the Carson's rules uh, slide. Okay, there, right there. Okay, so we showed this demo a moment ago where we had FM transmitter on a spectrum analyzer. And when you weren't talking, you just have the single peak at the center frequency. And when you do talk into it, the energy spreads out wider. So there's a formula for that that says that basically a 75 kilohertz uh, modulation signal the 20 kilohertz tone, 98% of the transmit power should be in about 190 kilohertz of bandwidth. And so based on that, there's some coordinators out there that say all RF at a big event, like a big football game, for instance, should be spaced 200 kilohertz apart. But it's only half of the system. It's the transmitter. On the receive side, the IF strip, the IF bandwidth needs to be about four times the maximum deviation or approximately 300 kilohertz. And so the uh, the next slide is a block diagram. Go ahead and go to that. Do you want me to play Carson's rule again, the, the video? 
Did everybody see it before? Uh, maybe, but let's play it again because you've explained what it's all about. Okay, go ahead. We turn the internal speaker up and we can hear that 1K tone that we're modulating at 25 kilohertz of deviation. We're going to turn that off for a moment. Zoom in on the receiver and the spectrum analyzer. And we've got the carrier frequency of 500 megahertz, maybe a little bit of noise modulating it. 10 kilohertz per deviation, so a pretty narrow view. Let's go back and turn on that generator again. 25 kilohertz of deviation. We're receiving it, 0.6% distortion. Zoom back in. Now Carson's rule says that 98% of our energy, our RF energy, should be contained in the bandwidth defined as the 1 kilohertz tone plus the 25 kilohertz of deviation times 2. And that gives us 52 kilohertz of deviation. 10k per span, one, two, and a half, a little over from there to there should contain 98% of our energy. And yeah, we'll call that good. But that works for transmitters. For receivers, we need much more bandwidth in order to recover that signal with no distortion. So now we're back on the receiver block diagram page. Okay. We talked about how much power and how much bandwidth the transmitter takes. In the receiver, the first block uh, coming in from the antenna is an RF amplifier, and then a front end filter, and then a mixer. These are frequency dependent components uh, on the board. So, um, the, uh, the range of the receiver, uh, a Sure J5, uh, Sennheiser in a uh, A block and a B block, is controlled by components on the PC board in these blocks. From the mixer on, everything is stock standard across all frequency ranges. The local oscillator is used to down convert the frequency coming in from the antenna to an intermediate frequency. Uh, could be uh, 10.7 megahertz. And that audio is then demodulated in an IC in the demodulator. That IC is the same one used in your FM receiver in your car or in your stereo at home or in your TV set. It's a common building block IC. It's been around since the 70s. And it takes the, the FM signal at 10.7 megahertz and converts it into audio. It's designed to work with a certain amount of, uh, of maximum deviation. In the US, we use 75 kilohertz as the maximum value. So there's an IF filter block in between the mixer and the demodulator. And that filter right there has to be four times wider than the maximum deviation that you're going to demodulate or you get distortion. So we've got a video in a moment where we're going to walk through and I'm going to demonstrate changing, uh, tran or I'm going to transmit a signal at a different amount of deviation and I'm going to change the IF filter and we can see we can measure and hear the distortion. Let's go ahead and play that next video. We we'll go back to duplex mode. We've got our 25 kilohertz signal being received on the receiver, 0.6% distortion. Let's turn that off for a moment. Now we're simulating an IF strip bandwidth of 300 kilohertz with this filter here. If we change that to a really narrow value, like 15 kilohertz, 
we need this value to be at least or approximately four times wider than the maximum deviation here in order to receive a clean signal. Now this distortion measurement is actually signal to noise and distortion so the signal to noise ratio is going to be pretty low so this distortion value is going to show higher than the actual audio distortion is. We're going to turn that sig gen on 1 kilohertz and we've got a fair amount of distortion here. This is there's a lot of noise built into this as well. If we change this value to 5 kilohertz, 4 times that is 20, which exceeds this filter value. And our distortion goes up and is we can hear the distortion now. But if we change that IF bandwidth filter and make it wider to 30 kilohertz, now remember, five, four times this is 20, so we're less than the filter here, and our distortion has gone down. If we change this really wide to 300 kilohertz, our distortion drops more. Go back to 30 kilohertz for a moment, and let's change this value to 10. Okay. 4 times 10 is 40, which exceeds this value, and our distortion has gone back up. 300 kilohertz. Let's go to 75 kilohertz. And our signal to noise ratio is much better, and our distortion is low, so the overall synad value is 0.3%. Go ahead, we're back on the 299-300 screen. Right. So the video for me is also not playing quite well. It's uh, never actually finished at my end and it was chopping up. So 4K video for future shows doesn't work real well, it needs to be down converted. So what the video showed was if we have a narrow IF strip, we have a lot of audio distortion. If we open the IF strip up to at least 300 kilohertz wide, then it will pass a 75 kilohertz signal nice and clean. So from a frequency coordination perspective, and this goes back to uh, IMD PC, or I'm sorry, to UHF IMD, which is the UHF software that Vega had, uh, had written. We've been using that 300 kilohertz value ever since. There are times when you want 400 kilohertz because 300 is just not enough. Um, in ear monitors being driven hard, uh, I have seen them, uh, certain uh, brands and models will splatter past the in internal limiter and they will deviate much wider than 75 kilohertz. Um, so, one of the questions that comes up with IAS is why do we use 299 rather than 300? Okay. With computers, they simulate um, decimal values. It's a, called a floating point number. If you remember back in the old 286 days, uh, there was a, a math coprocessor that you could get for your computer. Uh, with the modern machines, the math coprocessor is built in, but integer math one, two, three, can be done on a computer way faster than decimal or floating point math, like uh, 1.2, 1.3. And when IAS was first written in 96, 97, when we first started working on it, uh, performance was an issue. And so it was originally written to use integer math Basically, what's displayed on the, um, on the screen where it says 500 megahertz, that's actually 500 million hertz. And internally, we were using hertz to do the math because it was faster. But we can't display 500 million on the screen. Uh, nobody likes to deal with that, that kind of number. We don't display 300 kilohertz 
or rather, we do display 300 kilohertz, we don't display 300,000 hertz. So when you, you have to make a decision. Uh, do you arbitrarily subtract a few hertz off of every value in IAS? Or do you just display 299 instead of 300? Because and I'm going to show, demonstrate this in a moment. We don't want the modulation envelope to overlap between two different carriers. So what is the modulation envelope? If you go back to that first video where you talk, as I talk into the FM mic, you can see how it, the signal spreads out. And the block diagram of the receiver where the IF bandwidth is uh, the driving factor for receiving a signal without distortion. It all comes back to the hardware. And so we pick values where if we put uh, two signals closer to, than 300 kilohertz apart, we can expect to have interference. Why does it work at 200 kilohertz sometimes? Because things are farther apart, uh, uh, transmitters are farther apart from each other. But if you try to do that with, uh, let me step back. Lauren talked about doing a coordination at a football game where people within an organization are coordinated in one zone but people in other organizations which may be on the far side of the field or a different zone. That comes back also to people within one organization where they have everything within a few feet of each other and near their rack. You want to keep them at least 300 kilo, kilohertz apart on their frequencies. The people on the other side of the field, maybe you could space them 200k from users on the, on the close side of the field. But the problem is, is when they walk around the edge of the field to get a good shot or to do an interview, now they're close to the people on the close side of the field and you don't have good real-time control over that. So while some coordinators say you can put all the frequencies every 200 kilohertz apart, my position has always been, you can't. You need to keep them 300K apart. And it's not because of the transmitter in Carson Jewel, it's because of the receiver and demodulating the audio. Um, so we talked a little bit about the math and, and why the math is shown. Okay, so the modulation envelopes, if you draw an imaginary line, uh, 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 curve over that single frequency, which I'll show on the next uh, slide, we don't want those curves, the skirts of the curves, to overlap. And so there's five different combinations that we have to test for in the math in IAS. Obviously, if we have two frequencies, 500 meg and 500 meg, that are directly on top of each other, then their envelopes are going to overlap as well. But IAS can also deal with wide modulation and narrow modulation, such as a BTR80N, which is narrower modulation, than a BTR-800, uh, which is, uh, uh, they're both wireless intercoms, but one's a narrow band. So theoretically, you could pack a, uh, a signal from a, an ADN more closely than 300K, whereas a BTR-800, it needs elbow space out plus or minus 175 or total 300K. So, Exact matches, if the first freak partially overlaps the second and vice versa, and if the first freak is completely contained inside the envelope of the second freak, but offset so it's not a direct match and vice versa are the five different combinations. Next slide. So the actual code that's being used in IAS to test for direct hits is shown right here, copied and pasted out. We take that 300 or that 299 and we divide it by two and we add it and subtract it to the frequency that we're being tested to create this envelope. And we do the same thing with all the other frequencies that we're comparing against and we do this, these uh, couple of if statements and if they test true, then we have a direct hit and if not, then we don't have a direct hit and we move on. And next slide. So here's my ugly hand-drawn 
modulation envelopes of a narrow band and a wide band signal sitting next to each other. The first row are two signals that aren't overlapping. The second row are overlapping on the low end and overlapping on the high end, which are conditions that we have to test for. And the third row are the two frequencies are not exactly aligned. So the first test doesn't apply, but the third set of tests uh, or test four and five in the previous slide where one is contained within the other apply and so we consider that a direct hit so for everybody that's asked why 299 versus 300 ias doesn't try to hide what it's doing under the hood it actually go back to the previous slide because there's a point there ias um shows you what it's doing uh, and one go back one more and keep going back there we go these last three or the last two points here uh no pro audio device tunes in less than five kilohertz steps meaning uh you can choose a frequency of 500 or 505 mega or sorry 500.05 uh 500 megahertz 0 0.005 kilohertz, 0 0.010, 0 0.015, etc. Most of them tune in 25 kilohertz steps, and a few in 125 kilohertz steps. So we could subtract one hertz from all these values and display them as 0.3 in IAS, or we could not hide what we're doing and not try to make that decision for the user because it really doesn't matter anything between 0.299999 and 294999 will give the exact same results it's just that it's hard to display all that and that's because the center frequency or each tunable frequency of the transmitter is at least five kilohertz apart so if you have that value of 0 0.299 um, down to 0 0.294, anything in there will get the exact same results. Does that explain to you guys? Works for me. I've been wondering about this for years. And so we could display it. We could change it to 300K for display purposes, but then we have to convert it back and forth each time. We just, I just made a decision to show it as 299 and let people know that, because if, if you change that value to, to 300 kilohertz yourself, you will not get as many frequencies because the envelopes only tune in five kilohertz steps. So they're always gonna be increments of five kilohertz or 25 kilohertz apart. And so if you bump that up to 300 or, or 310, you're going to skip the next several tunable frequencies as direct hits when they're actually not. So if you wanted to set it wider for, let's say, in your monitors, maybe set it to 399. For 400 kilohertz. And I'm actually going to demonstrate that in IAS in a few, uh, at, at the end because um, there's some some tricks that you can play there, but also things you have to be aware of with inheritance. Uh, let's go ahead and roll forward a couple of slides. Into the next. And the next. The next is a video. Okay, let's, let's go and show that. And we're gonna, this is a comparison of a digital transmitter versus an FM transmitter. Here we have an Axiant Digital, set to 590 megahertz. We'll turn it on. And we have a cursor set up at 589.750, which is 25K from the center, total of 50 kilohertz maximum deviation. With an FM system, the louder you yell into a handheld microphone, the more deviation there is. With a digital transmitter, it doesn't matter. 
the same occupied bandwidth no matter whether there's maximum audio or minimum audio being transmitted through that device. So it allows you to predict your channel spacing a bit more. Go straight into the Intermod video. I'm not hearing you. You're muted. Yep, you're muted. Let me talk about this one for just a moment. The FCC uh, is repacking everybody down tighter. We all know that. Spectrums have been going away for a long time. FM transmitters kind of torque off the, P, uh, the FCC because they're not spectrally efficient. Whereas these digital transmitters are. Um, you can see the much narrower modulation envelope of this digital transmitter, and it's predictable because it doesn't change as you push more audio or louder audio through it. So it's uh, definitely the wave of the future. And I'm also going to show how we can set up some models in IAS uh, when we do some demos in a moment. Let's go ahead and do. Um, the next video, which is uh, kind of the, the core reason of IAS. There's a quick demonstration of transmitter intermod products. I've got two transmitters here. I'm going to turn one of them on, 480 megahertz. I'm going to turn the second one on. It's set to 481. And all those intermod products. Now, moving them closer to the antenna or shielding the antenna doesn't have any effect. But shielding them from themselves can have a dramatic effect. Kind of awkward. Simply putting a bit of space between them fixes the problem. I assume you push play, Pete. Changing the orientation uh. gets the antennas away from each other, shields them, fixes a large part of the problem. When you have transmitters sitting on your table, Kelly, you're not seeing talent, it. It's rolling, and they're all turned on and they're piled up. It's good. Going to step on your receivers. If you put them in baking tins, you have the effect of shielding them from each other, and you largely eliminate the problem. This is not an IAS frequency coordination issue. We don't try to predict all these extra products because the power level drops off and in normal use with proper procedure, you don't have the issue to begin with and you can clean them up. Those are intermod thirds being shown. All the rest of this is spurious transmission, fifths, sevenths, etc., that you just don't normally have to deal with once you move these away from each other and away from the receive antenna. Would you like to roll that again? Jason, do you want to see it twice? Um, depends on the quality for, how's the audience uh, receiving it? Kelly? Well, uh, we gotten a couple, one, one kind of not so fun uh, uh, response from one of our attendees, but uh, yeah, the uh, one person saying, you need to give up on the videos. Um, well, that was our last so, video, so we, we essentially have given up then. We give up there, and those of you, um, you know, yeah, you're right. This is amateur hour. We're not pro. We're not pro presenters. So, um, yeah, there you go. We're done with video. So let's move forward next. Back to PowerPoint. Of course, the the other way of showing it is with still pictures, but that's kind of doesn't really show the uh, the dynamic nature. Um, I think you were right, though. If we had a lower uh, bandwidth uh, video, it would uh, translate much better to the world who doesn't have giant internet pipes to every place. Yes. So what we were, you were showing there was a couple of transmitters that will step on each other um, if you put them... Okay, so you've got your RF table set up and you're ready for your mics to go out to talent. 
you've got all your transmitters turned on and they're going to cause intermod that we were showing on the screen that if you simply put your hand over the antennas you can cause some of that intermod to go away um, if you turn the orientation so that the antennas face opposite directions you can get some of it to go away if you physically space them out on the table farther but you can't always do that so what we started doing many years ago was basically building a little mini faraday cages around each of the transmitters while they're sitting on the table using baking pie tins uh, they're cheap you can get them at the grocery store and they keep things organized as well so you can keep your transmitters turned on you can listen to them but you're less likely to step on your receivers okay ias can't predict everything what we do is we predict thirds and fifths direct hits etc but if you load all your transmitters on the table in a pile or put them in a bucket all turned on to take them back to the dressing rooms shift command stuff. colon sorry about that yep so that was the purpose of that video and what it was what it shows if you download it later kind of opens up a little bit um pete let's go ahead and show my screen and i'm going to do some stuff in ias to answer some more questions Uh, and clean. Uh, you got me? Yep. Okay. IAS. So let's throw a couple of frequencies on 500, 501. 502 and now we start seeing intermod products and we'll zoom in on the graph this window right here was purposely made to look like the original uhf imd pc uh, software from vega i'm going to go ahead and accept this i'm going to zoom in so we've got three signals or three transmitters here in the candidate list so they're light blue and we've got intermod products from them I'm going to move two of them over. They turn dark blue, and we still have these intermod products. I'm going to clear the list, and I'm going to add 502 again to demonstrate these intermod products that start showing up. We could see these in the video, uh, the intermod thirds, and People will often ask, where, you know, what rules can I turn off when I need to start reaching for more frequencies? If we look in options, all the rules are, oh, sorry about that. All the rules are turned on by default. And I recommend starting with this because this will be the most conservative. But if you really, really have to start reaching for frequencies, start by turning off or start by turning on the bypass window maybe set it to 70. i know other people like to go down to 30. it all comes back to your equipment we're predicting what you, the receivers are going to see so if you have third-party rf filters yeah maybe you're good for 30. um if you have uh, this big distributed antenna system maybe you don't want to go below 70. But if you still aren't getting enough freaks, turn off three transmitter thirds. Because if you put all your stuff in pie tins on the table and you take one out at a time, or you take two out and you put them on talent, the talent, unless they're hugging each other, and even then if they're, they're gonna be in the middle of the stage, which is way away from your receive antennas, you're probably not gonna see three transmitter thirds at the receiver. So that rule is one of the first ones that I personally turn off. The second is if I really, if I still have to reach, I'll start turning off fifths. So I'm only calculating the thirds. Um, when do you do that? When do you make those decisions? Well, when you can't find any good freaks. Uh, and be aware that, you know, of what your environment, if you've got a really complicated show with a 
ton of frequencies sitting on stage, you might not want to do that. You might want to leave fifths turned on all the time. If you're in a football stadium and you've got people spread literally 100 yards from each other, eh, turn off fifths. You'll probably be fine. That's also what drives the, uh, the decision for zones. Um, one of the demos that I, one of the things I wanted to show was how we do a big industrial or a, a, a corporate show. And come on, show this, open this PDF. Orlando Orange County Convention Center, North and South Hall is a good example. It's a huge building. I have my biggest shows that I've ever done, which were 400 frequencies, um, I did in the North South Hall. The first thing I do in my pre-production is I go out to the convention center and I download their, uh, their floor plans. And I print them out so I've got, you know, a bunch of blank or a bunch of paper copies that I can write notes on. Zoom in on the North South Hall and the breakout rooms. If you put a wireless mic on the second floor breakout room, you are generally not going to be able to get a direct signal received in the North uh, breakout rooms on the other side of the building. So when you're the kind of corollary is if you have a wireless mic in South 210A, you're not going to receive it in South three, uh, South 230G. It's just too far away, and there's too much stuff in between. This is where zones come into play, and people ask, well, how big should the zone be? It depends on where you're at. It depends on the building. It depends on how complex. If you have wireless mics in, in two rooms with just an air wall separating them, they should probably be in a single zone. Personally, what I found is South 210 can be a zone, 220 can be a zone, and 230 can be a zone. Um, or maybe 210 and half of 220. And then you kind of have to play the game of moving stuff from one zone to another to make sure it's good. But if you need freaks and you're running out and you need to put more systems over in the North Hall, Open up another file and create a whole nother coordination in IAS because it's just so far away, you don't even have to play games with zones at that point. You're just not going to receive a signal. But if you have an expo hall on the, the big floor, there's a good chance that those are going to see the breakout rooms on the second and third floor. So again, there you will probably want to play with zones. Back to IAS. If you look at options, IMD spacing for UHF, the default bandwidth of 299, which is basically 300 kilohertz apart. Um, let's clear those. I'm going to put 500, and I'm going to try to put something at 500.3. Doesn't get hit, it doesn't get called out as a direct hit. And since those are the only two freaks, there's no intermod products. Let's clear that list. 500 and 500.275 won't work. Called as a direct hit. Um, and that's because this equipment theoretically tunes at 25 kilohertz increments. Very set this to 295, it still gets called as a direct hit. If I change my options and make this 294, tab off that, hit OK. Now, it lets me put that freak in. So you can see how I was saying anything up to that five kilohertz boundary is going to give you the same results. Now, 
I'm going to move these two frequencies over and look at the properties. This first one was picked and inherited from generic, and its uh, default bandwidth. Okay. Two ninety four. Both of them have that. Uh, okay, it's because when they got moved over, they got copied. Let me clear these out. Go back to two ninety five or two ninety nine rather. Okay. That. Yeah. Let me make this clean. Move that into the coordination here. Move on. Move that into the coordination. The properties inherited that 299 value right there. I'm going to pick another frequency, oh, 600 meg. But before I do, I'm going to change this property to 399. Take that, move it over. And it inherited that 399. The first one, and it picked it up as well. So as you change these values, anything that inherits from generic is going to start using um, these values. Like that. And that was applied for 600. 600 is at 399. Oh, and 500 is at 299. Okay, so let's refresh that and double check that they did change. 299 and 399. So if we, once they're in the coordination, if we change the value, then the value sticks. So say this is um, my CEO or my ref mic, and I want to elbow out some, some room. I change the properties for that one mic to be wider. And I'm going to name that one wide. And I'll name this one standard. Now I want to pick some more freaks. If I control Okay. I'll just uh, do a That's interesting. Why is it not? Well, I apologize. Um, oh, the reason being is there are no other freaks for this generic that it can choose from. Let's open this uh, properties back up because these values are set to zero. I'm just going to open and say this piece of equipment can go 600 to 650. Now I can control F it. And each one of these, bring it over, inherited that wide value. Let me edit this, 500 to 550. OK, control F it, found a bunch of freaks, move one of them over. Move one of them over. There we go. And it's still at 299. So it once you change the value for a frequency in the coordination, it sticks. How does this apply to user-defined models um, and band planning? So we go to user-defined models. I want to pick, uh, I'm going to do something electro in block 26. And it, it's inheriting this 399 value from the uh, from generic um, over here. 
So if I were to add, if I had picked one of those freaks and used it, it would have come in at 399 because of the way that value had previously been set. And you can save these to your own personal defaults or reset back to the factory uh, standard values. Let's then, yep. Electro calculate bring one note over and it's back to two ninety nine. Okay, in the previous demo, the list of models report was shown that shows all the values and which units inherit from default and which ones don't. Um, okay, let's take a, a step right here. In the, in the other show, there was a question about tech support. IAS does not preview reports correctly. Um, reports or output is HTML from IAS, and they're def they're shown in the default browser, and they're launched with a command line argument that will cause them to either preview or go straight to the printer. Those command line arguments, turns out, are only understood by Internet Explorer. Edge, Chrome, Firefox don't understand those command line switches. And that's why it doesn't work if you install a different browser and set it as your default. Why does IAS use HTML? Well, back in the early 90s, every production office had at least one computer hooked up to a printer and had a web browser. So you could output this, save it to a USB stick, take it into the production office and have them print your hard copy list for you. And So we were talking about user-defined models and band planning. So say you've got Electro. Okay, so Pete, you've done shows where you have the same equipment week to week. You're traveling and you're doing uh, concerts. So if you Correct. want to plan, IAS doesn't have a real good feature for that when you're using the recalculate functions. But if you take... Um, Sure. Oh, I want to drop this down. Say uh, a PSM 900 in the G7 band, and duplicate it, and give it a Pete G7 name. Then we go and change our band plan. It's got to be within the range. So let's say 520 is our lower end. We don't want to go any lower. If we go into presets. I know this is the painful part. Delete. And we delete. And we may have to clear them all, actually. But that's fine. So the presets, you can simply clear them if you don't need the, um, if they're not custom freaks and if you don't need the channel label. In this case, all we care about is the actual freak. So now I've got this custom model that your PSM 900, G7, that is now band limited. I put these into my coordination. Now, let's try that. Really? I'm going to put it into our system people. I keep hitting ignore. IEM. Pick some more of these. None of them are below 520 meg. Anytime I do a recalculate on this zone, they're not going to go below, below 520 meg. So 
you can't use this all the time uh, you know for an industrial where you're renting equipment might not work that well um if you're on a concert and, and you're touring and you've got the same equipment you can get, you know make up your own custom models it'll work great the other is for sports games where say cp communications sending out a package with um the nbc a package or the f package where that equipment went out at the beginning of the year it went onto that truck and they rent it for the entire season and so it travels with that truck if you tell a coordinator hey here's my f package can you pick frequencies for this you can import that zone into IAS. It'll come in um, as uncoordinated. If you right click and re-coordinate, it will shuffle those frequencies and it'll save you a lot of time. Um, Pete, can you go back to the slides for me for a moment? and share out the slide there we go okay so the points that i wanted to hit user-defined models oh and i'll show you where they're stored in a second generics html reports and large industrials uh and how to use zones so let's go back to presenting my screen for a moment and i'm going to show you where the models are stored close ias and it's going to prompt whether I want to save, I will not save that. It'll prompt me. Are you able to see my screen? No, no, not yet. Okay, are you able to see this dialogue? Yes, we are. Yes, yes. Okay, so I'm closing IAS and it's prompting wireless models have changed. Do you want to save them? If I hit no, then that Pete G7 model goes to the ether, it goes away. But if I save, it gets written to disk. If I open up, C drive, on this machine, I do not see a folder called program data, but it's there. If I type it in, There's a whole folder that's hidden by default. Who hides it? Microsoft does. Why? Who knows? But this is where common app data is stored for all applications and including IAS. We go into the professional wireless folder, IAS version 5, model definitions, and there's the model file that I just saved. If I open that up, it's a binary file, you can't really read it. But if I want to copy this and give a copy to Pete, I just email that off to him. Um, if you upgrade IAS, this folder is not overridden and your models stay available. If you move to another computer, you're going to want to come in here and grab any of your custom models, copy them over to the other new computer. One of the features, one of the limitations of IAS right now is that the built-in factory models are only available um, or only get updated when I publish a new version. And that's because they're actually written in code. But we can create new model definition, user-defined models, and save them out and send them to users. And we're talking about the best way to distribute them uh, on an ad hoc basis. If we move, if we were to move all of the model files to disk, machines with regular hard drives would take longer to load and start IAS each time you open a copy. That's why we do it in code so it's faster. But with machines that have SSDs, it's kind of a non-issue because they're so fast. So these are trade-offs that we have to think about as we're writing IAS uh, to be of the most benefit to the most number of users. One of the questions in the last show was, how do I pare down the list of models in IAS? Well, right now, everything is, is there um, 
you, you can't pare down the, the list of what's built in. But if we were to pull everything out and put them in definition files in a folder, then simply deleting them from that folder would reduce your list. Um, it's something that we're going to consider for future versions. Before we go too much farther, what kind of questions have come up so far that we need to deep, uh, drive into? All right. So let's see here. Um, I'll just start towards the beginning here. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Uh, this one's an easy one. It has really nothing to do with calculating. How many installations can you have per license? Technically one per computer. One per computer, gotcha. All right. So yeah, that's, that's the official answer. There you go. Um, next one from Andrew. I'd like the ability to have a main zone that all other zones coordinate with, as an example, corporate mics, IEMs, comms that are in constant use, and then um, band zones, which are only for the beginning or end of a show. Any thoughts or feature set like this, or how might you or Pete deal with that? Master zone, it will probably be in version six. We have certainly talked about it. I've needed it for years myself. I totally get it. Um, I can't do it in version five because of the way things work under the hood. The reason I'm rewriting stuff under the hood is to support features like that. Um, having multiple zones uh, besides one master is something that we've talked about or having time sliced zones um mm. but that's probably not going to be initially in version six maybe 6.1 or down the road we'll see what i've done is uh exported my master zone to a file and then i do import it and do a pre-show band coordination with that in the same file and then start a new coordination, import with my master zone, and do a post-show coordination. So they're all together. It's not nice that they're all in one file, but it does the same job. There you go. Um, this one's more of a statement, but uh, around the uh, Mac version not being um, given the option, I'd almost rather have the iOS version. Um, I think we all That's, agree with, with that, yeah. that in the world of, uh, in the world of cloud computing and um, uh, connectivity. With a tablet and having yeah. it in right your hand, walk up to a piece of equipment and not have to lug a laptop around and balance it. Yeah, that's probably the direction we'll go. Yeah, there you go. Um, I'll just, I need to fix one statement I made earlier. Nate, you did point this out. I mentioned some videos featuring Jason explaining the math behind AES. IAS. I should have been clear that the videos that we watched, that was about what drove the math, right? The the, the deviations and how we saw that interaction on the screen, which we're going to make sure everybody gets somehow. We'll have a link to. Um, so you can see that again. I've got it exporting on my machine right now. Um, but uh, that was my that was what I meant by the video showing us the math, right? What drives the math that you're doing? And then obviously you you spent a lot of time taking us deeper there um let's see here um i think you answered this already but um uh the ies taking a live feed from a spectrum analyzer not just a scan um thoughts there again it's a feature that we would definitely want to do um the feature I, that i've asked for is yes. not so much a live scan because but, yeah, in I mean, reality, and, and, the, scan, the, the scan never changes. I mean, day every few days it might change. Your scan never changes. The ability the to go to your, your money there. mic and say set center freak and have that be show up on the spectrum yeah. analyzer. Exactly. Yep. That's that's a feature that we've talked about. I'd like okay. to be able to click on a, a frequency in the selection list or in the main list or anything, just have it pop up one meg wide on my spectrum analyzer. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, hey, I'm seeing something weird. Hey, we're going to go to the backup in the next segment. Right. And exactly. now, now maybe this is something that, you know, to his point of live scans, maybe this is where um, 
again, a pay for feature comes into play with hooks to the various brands, right? That they yep. they call, make a call to a workbench, make a call to wireless designer, make a call to WSM. Hey, I just entered this at PWS now, tune me to here, right? Who knows, you know, uh, we can dream together. This so, morning we learned that WSM imports IAS no, files. Right, no, that's that's actually wireless designer. That's like WSM, it's only wireless like designer. WSM, right. Just a different manufacturer, sure. But same, same, so, same principle. Let's talk about Accent uh, and the Accent Wireless System Manager where frequencies can hop dynamically. Mm -hmm. how, that, how do you inter how do you let a system like that interact with IAS and vice versa? If you're the frequency coordinator, me personally, I don't want um, wireless system manager to allow that wireless mic to be reconfigured on the fly to any frequency. I want to know. No, where I want them to be manual. Man, do it manually. But if you pre-coordinate a bunch of spares. Right, that of course. Box and load those spares in it as allowed alternate frequencies and let it dynamically hop between them. You can protect those frequencies. You can make sure that they don't, yep. that, that you're protected from them and still get the benefit of the accent frequency hopping real time live um, changes. So there are happy mediums. Yeah, yep. that's the best of both worlds, right? Um, uh, let's see, how do things like sure high density mode fit into this 300K apart world, right? That's where you come up with a different model. So I'm going to go to user defined models. Actually, I'm just going to pull the report. The screen's a bit sluggish with uh, WebEx running. And Blame it on the webinar. Um, There's a song there. So here's a 946, and they actually, the, the Sennheiser 946, we spaced them out at 600K default spacing. Um, sure Accent, uh, I'm sorry, the Sure AD series are currently uh, defaulting, or uh, currently set to 300K separation, but, that Accent Digital that I demonstrated in the video is only 50K wide. Now, part of the issue is not just the transmitter, but the receiver. How much bandwidth does the receiver need to demodulate the audio and recover the audio, demodulate the signal and recover the audio without distortion or without dropping too many bits, which again would cause distortion. So it's not just the transmitter, it's also the receiver, but this is, you know, by creating custom models, we can narrow up the bandwidth if we want to. If you look here on this particular model where uh, it says disabled, we set the value to negative one, and that just turns off that test. So even if you have intermod uh, three transmitter thirds or intermod fifths turned on in your options, that particular model doesn't get tested for that uh, that rule because its receiver isn't susceptible to that type of interference. Is this file editable? This is just an out. This is a report. Oh, okay. You go into IAS itself and make a copy. Right, or change one particular one. So negative one. Now, if you change, if you edit one frequency right here, every time you recalculate that one frequency, it will inherit the settings from that one frequency. Correct. So when you do a system-wide recalc, that one frequency will be getting its default from the here, not from the options. Or if you go to user-defined models. Yeah, if you make a new model, I'm talking about if I edit one frequency, dynamically from then a it's standard only model. That one freak. And and because it, it sticks. But if you if you search for more of that model and bring them in, they will come in with that new value. So that's a, a, a an advanced search for more search for more control of, F you're saying? Yeah if you if you were so if I change this one to that negative one 
and I control right. and I bring in that value, it came in with negative one. Okay, All the yeah, yeah. Still have the original value. So you can shoot yourself in the foot if you're not careful with that feature. That's why I call it an advanced feature. Another question? That, that's pretty reasonable. Um, advanced feature and it's advanced. So there we go. Uh, let's see here. Um, of course, my computer's locking up now. Go figure. Uh, let's see. Pete, you got the question um, sheet pulled up there. I'm just scrolling through up to, uh, well, here we go. When it comes to digital transmission, how would you integrate them in a coordination knowing you have PSM 1000, G10, and G57? Would you consider harmonics for the G57 or simply line them up 500 to 600 K apart? So, in a lot of the digital systems, we've turned off the thirds and fifths and, and three transmitter thirds. See, like, for instance, here, uh, the Sony digital modulation, we mm -hmm. only connect hits and we've turned it off in the model. So let the model do its job, put them on the coordination, and the if an intermod third lands on the Sony frequency, it's not going to affect the Sony frequency um, the same way that the opposite would affect an FM transmitter. Kind of the same thing with wideband and narrowband. Let the models do their job. That's why you can put a RADCOM close up tight against a wireless mic, as long as the modulation envelopes don't overlap. You're not going to cause interference on the mic from the RADCOM and vice versa. Let the, the models are designed to keep that in mind. Gotcha. All right. Um, if you have 30 belt packs, can you check all packs for 2TX and 3rd and 5th order intermod and then select only four of the 30 packs for 3TX, 3rd and 5th order intermod? For instance, my two lead actors are double mic'd. So here's what I would do there. I would turn all my rules on when I first start picking my freaks. And I would bring over everything that I could in with the maximum rules turned on. Then I would label what I'm going to use. And then if I still have to reach, then I start turning off and start bringing over other freaks um, and label them as spares or a secondary. But it's still bi-directional. And if you recalculate, you're still going to run up with that same kind of issue. So if you're if you're really concerned about it, leave the rules on and or at the very least no matter what use good technique whereas you're using uh baking tins you're maybe turning the transmitters off when they're not out on talent um things of that nature to reduce the overall rf environment all right um when I use recalculate on tour, I feel like it doesn't give me good frequencies compared to starting over again. Is there something that I'm doing wrong? I think that's probably just a feeling. Um, no, no, no. You have to do it a special way, I found. You have to ahead. because recalculate doesn't, as far as I know, use the option settings from the original frequency, does it? No, it uses the current what other current values are. So, right. if you so to what you have to do is set your options for triple bead and fifth and everything, then just recalculate the the ears section. And what I typically do, rather than set up special models, is I do a control F on the ears in the particular band and manually pick the frequencies that I want from the list that work into the band plan I want. Then I'll go to the next section. If it's more transmitters, I'll stay with triple bead on. Then when I finally get down to the mics, I'll turn off triple beat and fifths and make the intermod only be uh, no further than 40 megahertz. And then 
find more frequencies that are only basically third order. And worst case, I'll do uh, mics without intermod calculations because they're never going to be near each other. They're never going to be used next to each other. And more than likely, they'll work fine. And that'll be my least coordinated item. But you're right. Just doing a plain old recalculate on the whole pile doesn't come out the same. That, and so you're absolutely right. And my statement was wrong. And here's why. Um, the recal okay, I just did a control F. And me personally, and I kind of don't even really think about it anymore. It's the way I've always used IAS. So we're kind of into the Redmond effect there. Um, when I get this list of candidate freaks, I never, or not, I try not to pick the first four. Okay, I pick every other one, or I try to space oh, yeah, it. Yeah. I use this list here, and I, which was added for this purpose. Okay, so I've got a nice big set of space around this freak. I'll take that one rather than that one. Um, maybe I'll take that one, even though they're they're showing side by side, they're really far apart. That's a good one, and those two are both good. And then I'll move. Just select it over. So I naturally spread my, my frequencies out. And, but the recalculate feature isn't that smart, and it could cause them to clump up. So I, I retract what I said before, and the person with the question, yeah, that is legit. OK. There you go. You know, that's why we all work together. Um, now, one, one other trick yeah. that I've done before is on recalculate a particular section. If I if I put in my scan and I've set and the DTV stations are all set, but the the band for that piece of a of a transmitter is wider and may cover several different open slots, I'll just turn on the DTV uh, yellow for those slots that I don't want it to go in and just yep. let it put transmitters in the ones I do want, which then may That's open up another TV channel for microphones. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, people ask, why uh, are these gaps here? When this scan was taken, it was taken in like 30 meg chunks and uh, kind of a wide resolution bandwidth, but you can still see a little bit of a dip at the channel boundary. If you were to actually take the spectrum analyzer and narrow in on this gap here, right on the channel boundary, what you'll see is that the uh, the modulation envelope, the transmission envelope of this DTV channel rolls off 384K above and below the channel boundary. And there's a guard band in between right centered on the channel boundary. It's about 600 kilohertz wide. I don't recommend and I don't uh, advocate putting frequencies in there, but it has been done with success in real world applications. I, I typically would have put BTR transmits in there frequency or yeah. because they're not as critical to the show and don't mind a little bit of interference. Now, somebody's going to say, but that's against FCC rules. Yes, it is. But the corollary is. You're doing this in a stadium on football game day. Ain't nobody there watching TV on a on a regular TV receiver. Yeah. Or if they are, they're in a booth or you know, they're in a, a club clubhouse somewhere, and even then it's probably coming in over cable. And so you're not gonna, you're legitimately very unlikely to cause interference doing this. But you absolutely have to be cognizant of that fact. When you IAS is a tool, it's like a screwdriver, uh, or it's like you can put a screw in with a hammer by pounding it in, but a screwdriver is a better tool for putting in a screw. Uh, IAS is just another tool, and you have to be aware of why you you can and can't do certain things. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Pete, is that good? You good there? Oh yeah. All yeah, right. definitely. Cool. Um, all right. Um, this came from KP. What's the size of the IAS family, meaning the number of users out there right now, you know, without disclosing something that you're not supposed to? Can you give us an um, idea how many of us are on? 
uh, about 2,500. Um, and of those, about somewhere between 18 and 2,000 active users, meaning people that have used IAS in the past 30 days. Okay, pretty significant. And that's based on them looking up on the 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 wizard, you you know if they're using it because they use the frequency no, wizard. No, IAS actually ping, checks ping for in. updates when oh, you okay. Open. If there's no updates available, it doesn't tell you. But as long yeah, as yeah. there's that connection, and that gets uh, the last date that it checked for updates is marked on the uh, license server, so we can get a rough idea. Um, why are there only two thousand instead of hundreds of thousands? Well, partially because of price. IAS isn't free, and it's not the cheapest item out there. And some people have told me, well, this needs to be a 99-cent you know, app. And, and Well, IAS was intended for professionals. How much did you pay for the cue box? How much did you pay back in the day for an, a, a license of Microsoft Office? Um, it was never intended for the 99-cent user to choke up our tech support and, and our phone calls uh, and our entire people up. It was intended for people that do pro audio for a living. Good point. And I've done uh, comparison videos of IAS and Workbench co coordinating the exact same list of frequencies with the exact same limitations of where I could put them and not put them. and they both do a perfect job without any problem and naturally they don't come up with the same numbers because they all yeah. calculate differently and have different random uh, uh, seeds but the ease of use of IAS compared to workbench is why I like it because it's much it's just it's just a screwdriver not a big electric hammer like workbench is yep i wrote i personally wrote IAS on show site on well, 80% of it, some of it on weekends, some of it at, uh, at night, but you know, a lot of it sitting on show site during rehearsal, waiting for the next executive to show up. So we've got dead time sitting there. So I'm working on the next feature. So now you have no excuse when we say when is version six coming out, because we know you have all that spare time. <laughs> uh, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. They're, they're <laughs> a full-time gig involved right now, so. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so here's another feature then while you have plenty of time on your hands. Um, it would be great to be able to import freaks from a scan. Is that coming? Like, Let's what do you mean? What does it mean, freaks from a scan? Uh, we'll let, uh, we can, uh, Ike, you want to weigh in on that on the Q&A mm -hmm. thing? I think probably identifying peaks, perhaps, um, uh, in mm -hmm. there. Yeah, maybe. Individual real frequencies, not TV stations. Right. Um, we'll come back to that one and follow it. Um, how's well, that sound? I, I can show you. Okay, so if we import frequencies from a file, um, import. Well, I think he was talking about doing it from a scan. Correct. Not from a, not from a list. Okay, well, yeah, if I import from a, well, there, this actually, question in the last show, why do they come in red when I import from a list? Well, that's because they haven't been calculated. But and they're uncoordinated, if, right? And you it can't is, change them. You're, they're, they're, the, they're the incumbent frequencies. You have to work around them. Just leave them as, as red. If you then recalculate your frequencies around those, then even if trouble uh, you know, when you're not there, that's yeah. that's on yeah. them. That's their responsibility. But your freaks aren't going to step on them, and vice versa. Okay, I did want to point out another question or something that was discussed in the the other show. The basic show was importing sweep data. Um, if I import sweep data, these are SPA files from uh, an Enrizi SPA uh, site master. We can import key site files. We can import um, from TTIs. We can import just a regular list of, of freaking amplitude. I'm going to import this. And 
And here, if I just hit OK, that's going to show up on the graph. But if I put some information in, and especially a lat long, I have to put a couple values in, and I have to put a name, then this button down here, share with others, lights up. If you put in legit values, and please you know, and test them by mapping the location and seeing, you know, are those coordinates real or not? And those aren't, obviously. And upload this, then the next time you use the TV wizard for those coordinates or within 25 or 50, or 50 miles of those coordinates, then that sweet data will show up for you or anybody else to download. It's completely crowdsourced by the users. So while it was demonstrated how to pull it down, nobody really talked about where it comes from initially. It's from you guys. So right, there right. Are several websites, including Pete, where we've uh, got a great selection of sweeps that were done all around the world. It's a bit of a pain to upload them in bulk. Pete's asked me about it before, and yeah, it, the pro the problem is mine are all zipped up in files with uh, several different scans in one zip, and I'd have to unzip them all and 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 do them one at a time, and, and it's a exactly. lot of work. Yeah, but if you do it when you first import the uh, the sweep, yeah. Um, then now what what you should add to that program every computer can look up where its longitude and latitude is based on the network it's connected to it. they can now however now if, they can yes if i try to do that feature on the machine i'm currently connected to it'll show up that i'm up in either atlanta or in washington dc because the way that my firewalls are set up in my mpls connection it I, I drain to the internet, not in this location. Well, and then what you also ought to do, you ought to put in this. a place to put in the zip code, because you all know the zip code of the site you're at. And that's yeah. a much easier piece of data to put in than, than the longitude latitude, which you have to go to the, the, the frequency wizard to look up. It, which is a pain. But yeah. I'm going to show, will you see this, this button right here, location right. is precise? If you put in lat long from um, for the zip code, it may be two miles away. Don't check that button. Got if it. you look on Bing Maps and you know exactly what your coordinates are, go ahead and check that because that tells yeah. people who download it what the quality of your data is. Yeah, uh, that's a what good feature. Um, yeah. So yeah, and Ike's point was uh, local carriers in your scan. So it was what we were saying, you know, these peaks and boom, boom, boom. Um, so that that was the point there. Um, let's see here. Um, Andy did come back with um, this was the question about the double miking of leads and things like that. And he says, unfortunately, the yeah. issues with the suggestions of tins and turning off transmitters isn't really a thing work for with the electrical, mics. right? So most we can right. really do is orient the antennas opposite. And sometimes you can't even do that because of costume restrictions. Just this point was, hey, it's an unusual beast. You know, it's just kind of what it is. And it, uh, it kind of is. And and it's it's a legit question. And when you war game everything and when you test everything, you can make adjustments there. And unless you have to make a change on the fly, um, after your war game, you're in good shape. By the way, what is a war game? Uh, a lot of the information that we are commonly asked is actually in the help file. Wargaming is described right here, step by step. And you should be doing this before your show every time. At, at each new location, that is, or after major changes. Yep. Can't. Can't stress that one enough, can we? Yeah. Um, that, IAS is a prediction tool and it an information management tool. Wargaming tells you what your receivers are actually seeing and did you push the right buttons? Oh, this was yep. set for 450 megahertz. No, it was set for 450.5 and I didn't notice. And now yeah, I'm speaking yeah. on the neighbor. Yeah, it's, uh, I've caught myself a few times, especially in the old BTR days, because I had always miss a digit by 25. It just ticked there me off. Um, can you talk about the math behind the recalc producing different results every time? It's because of the randomization feature. Um, performing a calc 
uh, searching for freaks, recalc feature. There's actually a discussion in here about how it works and how the priority feature works. Um, say you have a BTR 800 back in the day, uh, which tunes across three TV stations and 25K steps. So there's, I don't know, do the math, but let's call it 100 tunable frequencies for that device. And you have uh, a UHFR with 1,000 tunable frequencies. The recalculate all feature will prioritize and will calculate the BTRs before it calculates any frequencies for the, uh, the SURE because the sure has more room to move around. But it uses the, uh, the regular search feature, which is described here, but I can kind of condense it. Um, take all the tunable frequencies for that device, put them in a bucket, pull one out at a time, test it. If it's good, put it in the candidate list. If it's not, toss it out. Take the next freak out of the bucket. That bucket shrinks. When all the frequencies that have been used from that bucket, we're done testing. At that point, we have some candidates and some bad. They were taken out of the bucket in a random order. The old Vega software would always start at the bottom and work its way up to the top. So it would go 500, 501, 502, always. And you would get good freak, good freak, good freak. Bad, 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 good freak, bad, 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 bad. And, and your energy would be loaded at the bottom end of the band. IAS from day one randomized that search so that the energy was more evenly distributed across the tunable range. Also, if you're having trouble finding frequencies, continuously hitting search, 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 eventually you'll get one or two more. The, Correct. the number in the list will change depending on the calculation seed. Yep. All right, um, and um, uh, you know, Jason uh, threw in a note here. Another trick for recalculate only maintains your band plan if you create user models, as Jason described. If you don't do that from the start, recalculate allows bands to overlap. Is, that is correct. Point. Um, let's see. The harmonics rules uh, are apply to all of the frequencies being used what if i want to consider the fifth for iem and only the thirds for mics is there an advanced setting that could apply to that not at this time okay well not all for right. not 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 for overall recalculate right but individual I mean, recalculate manually... you can change your your uh, your options for each separate frequency yeah right you just have to do that in a, a freak by freak though yeah, um, that's exactly. a lot of work. And, and there isn't like a category where you could say, okay, IEM, if you're in this category, choose this. And if you're in this category, choose that. Potentially, and we can't do it right now with the way things work under the hood, but potentially in version, I get things fixed. You may be able to do that on an assignment or a zone basis. Okay. Uh, send that as a request to support at professionalwireless.com so we can add it to the wish list. All right, so Eric M., you heard that. Send it to support at professionalwireless.com um, about uh, that third, fifths in different types of uh, device headings. Um, here's a little follow-up to clarify what you were saying about disabling thirds in the models for digital units. Is that entirely disabling the whole third order calculation or only the one direction of it, which is what you'd need for a system mixing analog digital gear? Is it's disabled for the, the the model itself, which generally would mean the transmitter receiver pair that you're trying to pick a frequency for. So if a third is going to step on that uh, that unit uh, and the rule is turned off, it's ignored. Also, but if you change the if you've changed the spacing for a frequency, be careful that you don't put another frequency near it because its spacing may be closer. And if you did it second, it may be too close compared to your first spacing. So if, if you're changing stuff dynamically, you know, on an individual basis, yes, keep that in mind. Yeah. You may want to yeah. do a, a recalc to make, or, or you just 
here's a simple, um, let me get a chord open that, uh, hang on, let me close this. I just open one up, don't save, home, change to, uh, yeah, right, preview. Over here, you see this interval? The interval column here? Yep. That's the distance to the next freak. You can just scan down and see, do I have anything that's 300K away? Um, I want to go fix that. Yep. And by, by the way, this particular preview screen, if you copy it all, it pastes directly into Excel. Actually, design, especially the electrosonics models are designed, um, there's a, a little hidden apostrophe that comes in before yep. the channel. So specifically so that Excel doesn't try to change the value to a date. It leaves it as text. Yep. So now you can edit and play with it and sort it, and do all kinds of stuff with it. And uh, let's just repeat, that wasn't really part of the question, but it's an awesome point there. And that was um, the, uh, when you go back to IAS to export that, right? Into a, uh, a so Say that again, preview. Kelly, we're missing half, half your words. That was what I just wanted to identify for everybody, the preview. The preview of the, of the normal, yeah. right? Right. Way to export freaks from my bench or vice versa. Um, we can import scan data. Um, so uh, uh, you do an RF scan in Workbench. So there's a way, it's kind of hidden. I don't know if they've exposed it to make it easier to find, but it saves an XML file. IAS recognizes that, I, that XML file and can import it as scan data. Scan Other, data, but not frequencies. Not frequency. No. Uh, and, and part of that's because having it, you know, uh, I don't know that Workbench has a good way to export a list of freaks except as a report. With IAS, it export, if we were to export as a PDF and then trying to, trying to do what we just did into Excel is miserable. But as HTML, it's kind of seamless. That's another reason why and we were talking about PDF reports in version six, but now, there's plus and minuses, right, to yeah. having PDFs, and I get it. Um, uh, Ken had a question. Is there any difference between sweep and scan, the, those two terms as used no, in? No, no, it's I would say the same. Really. Yeah, they're, we use them interoperably. Um, can you talk about the sweep amplitude scaling? how it works in the graph. So I think what you're at, I guess you broke up. I think what you were asking is how the sweep works in the graph. Um, it, it's primarily, the amplitude. there is a, uh, the amplitude is the lowest amplitude of the data that you import is set at the bottom of the graph and the rest is scaled to not peak at the top. So it's not, in, in the current version five, um, it's representative, it's not um, calibrated. And another question is why do the values show up down in the, the status bar as you scroll over? Well, if we zoom in here, you see that peak right there? I have the cursor over it and I have the value. The next frequency that was imported is here. I don't know what's in between. We simply draw a line in between. Um, depending on the resolution bandwidth and the overall span of what you import and how many files you import is going to gen is going to dictate how granular that information is. How big were those scans? You said 30, 30 meg or were they 60? Those were probably 30 meg wide and yeah. uh, 
and resolution bandwidth of probably 300 kilohertz, uh, whatever the default that instrument was. Yeah, I have a friend who does single channel scans for her whole coordination. It makes for a very, very dense scan, but it you does. can see individual frequencies. Yes. On the other hand, for my purposes, this is a DTV station. No question. Exactly. Asked. Exactly. Okay. So have you considered taking amplitude into consideration with IAS? Uh, example, yes. um, ULXD, one milliwatt, 10 milliwatt, and other okay. things. Okay. That, that's, that's kind of a different question. So let me answer it two ways. One, um, I have been experimenting uh, with a squelch function where you can set a, a squelch value on the graph and it will automatic, kind of like wireless workbench does, will automatically set deny zones if your sweep data exceeds the squelch value, in which case here it would block out this DTV channel automatically. Now, let's go back to other people have asked the same question, but in a different way. Intermod products based on high and low power or 100 milliwatt versus a 30 milliwatt transmitter. No, and here's why. Take that 100 milliwatt trans, two 100 milliwatt transmitters, put one down five feet from your antenna, put the other one down at the far end of the thrust which is uh, 75, 80 feet from your antenna. The power levels are different. Tell me which one is the 100 milliwatt, and which one is, is the 10 milliwatt in that case. Well, they're both 100 milliwatt, but your power levels are different because of distance. That's why we don't try to predict based on power level and IAS. We simply predict based on the frequency math. Makes perfect sense. Um, is it possible to mark a frequency as a bad frequency once you have coordinated? It would be great if you could mark a frequency as bad. This way you could have a record of what frequencies you have used once you're in a show. It sounds I like a monitor it. engineer note to me. Oh, to I just there. drag it into another zone called, uh, called bad. Exactly. I, I do the same thing. Avoid, bad, whatever. And then if you do a recalculate, you're guaranteed not to land on that. Or if you do a search or a force recalculate, you're guaranteed not to come back to that bad frequency. Because it's staying in your in your queue of frequencies that have been called out. And it stays there with its elbows out 300, you know, K wide right. in this. That makes makes a lot of sense. Uh, here's a. Uh, just a little more on the digital models, because obviously we're going to be spending a lot more time in this world. Um, if I have one analog transmitter and one digital transmitter, the analog's TX or transmitter model would flag that conflict, even though the digital model is disabling that on its end. So the way the frequencies are calculated are... Per, think of it in terms of per receiver, per frequency. So when we pick a frequency, we're making sure that it's not taking interference or, or not predicted to take interference from the other frequencies. Um, on the other hand, digital modulation doesn't generate intermod products kind of quite the same way. Um, what intermod products there are, are very spread and very low power, simply because of the way the modulation works. Gotcha. Um, Alvaro is saying, can you please repeat if there's a way that once I calculate these frequencies, I export this to Workbench and Workbench takes the frequencies as good frequencies. For backups and swap those in case. Um, uh, we were talking about the Axiom yeah. uh, frequency controller, where correct. Yeah. It can Spectrum Manager, where you Spectrum, have that yeah, candidate Spectrum frequency Manager. list, the CFL, and that's where you're inputting. But it, I believe that all has to be done through the Workbench interface. It well, does. if you put well, frequencies, you if you put frequencies from IAS into Workbench into the controller. It's going to watch them for interference. 
it's not going to be doing intermod calculations at that time. Correct. Only if you Correct. do a that recalculate is. in Workbench will it do intermod calculations, and then guaranteed it will flag them as bad frequencies because it's doing it using a, a different. They don't use it's Arabic accurate. numbers there. Yep. Yeah, they, at that point, your past calculations, it's simply watching for interference. Right. Um, and yeah, it's doing and, it automatically uh, faster than you can. So that's the whole point of, of using it. Exactly. And we'll be doing a follow up on Workbench at some point because we've gotten a lot of questions over the past couple of weeks. So we'll, we'll circle back around to that. Um, can you overlay multiple scans, uh, one full spectrum and then more precise channels or blocks? Yes, you can. It just starts getting a bit noisy. Um, so here's one scan. I'm just Maybe if they could be colored. Yeah, you're right. Uh, and that's definitely something that I should consider. Uh, I'm just going to import something from somewhere else. Um, Or not team. like in, in Workbench, you can put in multiple scans and use a checkbox to turn each one on or off to look at different scans. Yes. They are actually stored in memory as different data sets. Uh, so you yeah. could, theoretically, I could add that to the UI. Uh, part, of, part of the design decisions of IAS is to try not to make it too cluttered. So I got to be careful with what features I expose. The reason I went to the ribbon is because the old UI was simply too cluttered. The ribbon lets me do things that. Uh, also, when it goes into iOS, it'll be you, you can use your fingers. Yeah, and but it's the same thing with your tablet. Pete was the first one who came back to me about having trouble touching some of these buttons when on his tablet and the IAS was scrunched too small. They yep. start icons and the letters start disappearing yeah uh, so i tried to do some work for him on that to to make that a little better i don't know if i was successful but you know, hey i just made my finger skinnier yeah hey, he's very adaptable that way you, exactly. you know that exactly take a pencil uh, sharpener put your finger into it then it's perfect yeah um uh, Bal just made a couple uh, notes here. Uh, his experience wireless workbench it is is buried in there. But we were talking about the other direction where you're taking. I believe in the one example was um, getting from IAS where you've plotted your solution, and now you want to whatever, whether it's wireless manager, whether it's workbench, whether it's WS. Well, it depends on the features of, uh, of how they import freaks. With IAS, if you can get it to Excel, you can carve this out to a list of freaks. Control C here, uh, save them out, file, save at. Yes, these are a lot of steps. I get that. But save it as, uh, save it to, I don't know, as a CSV. And it's just a text file, list of frequencies then. What are their features for importing a list? None yet. So I can't, I can't solve all of it. I, I, I can show you how to get part way, but there has to be features on both sides. Any more, okay. Kelly? If we Andy all and had a, a common and, and all agreed on a common format, yeah, I'd roll that in so that you could export and import that common format and be interoperable with all the other software. I'm fine with that. No, I did absolutely. I see no downside to it either way. You know, I mean, uh, the, the point is that their equipment controls their hardware, and 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 we, and IAS is a paid program, so you pay yeah. for it. And if if we could enter exit. Uh, export the name of the device and what kind of device it was plus the frequency so they could be easily imported both ways that's all you need yeah and someday we'll get around to fleshing out features where we can talk 
the thing is, is when IIS was first developed, there were no devices that could be uh, used that way. And then once there were, it required a lot of external extra hardware that usually wasn't available in show site. Right, now, right. In a modern way, every, trans, every receiver has an Ethernet port on the back and right. the protocols. We just have to go now and, and flesh out those features. Well, I think Kelly's back, maybe. Are you back, Kelly? You went away for a second. But I think we've come pretty much to the end now. Uh, so I think we, I, uh, is that you, Kelly? I'm back. I'm not happy, but I'm back. Yeah, yeah me neither. Me neither. We'll I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to speak to my internet provider. I hate the internet. <laughs> exactly. I, but exactly. I love it all at the same time. Um, I think we got through um, Darth Epperson. Thank you, Dave. Uh, yes, I love that. Um, can you guys hear me enough to get through? Barely, yes. barely. Barely, all right. I think we call it a day. I uploaded handouts. Can everybody hear that? Yeah, we heard that. And the, the videos are, are there's a Dropbox link for the handout, the videos? And I put it in the chat window. If people okay. go to the chat window, that's the Dropbox. We will have those videos on the website. Actually, I built a PowerPoint with the videos already in there that they'll, that'll play through. Um, we'll get all that up on our, uh, on our web overnight and tomorrow that will be there and available. But take a look at the uh, handout and the chat window if anybody's interested in right now. So, Jason, thank Good. you, buddy. Thank you, guys. Good to see you again. Yeah, yeah, same here. Um, keep the questions coming in, folks. Um, the uh, I'm sure between now and when we go back to work someday. Um, oh, yeah, that was one of the other questions. Will version 6 be out before we go back to work? It's a very relative <laughs> term, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. And unfortunately, no, it, it won't be out that soon. Hey, Are I you love kidding? That. That's an awesome answer, Jason. Exactly, exactly. Yes, yes. That's, it's a very wish list answer. It is. Uh, and we joined, Mac joined us for the closing. Glad you uh, made it through the day, Mac. Oh, yeah, I've been, I've been listening. Uh, I was even listening in the car on the way home, uh, but uh, I'm I'm also have a uh, a. Um... <laughs> I, I have a uh, happy hour going on Zoom. <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, come on. So uh, anyhow, thank you, everybody. The workday's uh, over, pal. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So it's five o'clock everywhere. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> Not the West Coast, but for me. So, guys, thank you so much. Jason, thanks again for coming in and doing a super deep dive on this. Uh, remember, folks, if you got features, ideas, send them to support at professionalwireless.com. Um, that mailbox is always open. And um, I thought there were a lot of cool questions. I learned a few more things today that um, I uh, didn't know were hidden away. So, Pete. Thanks as always for your awesome insights. Any uh, closing uh, remarks? Uh, I'm hoping that the video has better audio from the mics than than what we're hearing here, because I think a lot of the problems that I'm hearing are on my end. But uh, uh, maybe the video will be better. Well, that's my story every time we're on show site together. But you know, exactly, we can, we can fight over that later. But Jason, your exactly. checks in the mail. Um, we are prepared to pay you a uh, scale rate, um, right in double, line with double what we offer. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you again, thank man. Thank you guys for the great idea of practical show tech. Hey, there no we go. Problem. And uh, we'll be um, we'll be pinging you every so often. Thanks a lot, man. Yep. Bye, -bye. bye, guys. So long. Bye -bye.